Hey guys, this is Stephanie Lemlin, and I play the computer, and also Artemis, and you're listening to Whelmed, The Young Justice Files. Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, zero, one. Recognized, Lolita Ritmanis, D, four, two. Recognized, Michael McQuiston, D, four, three. Recognized, Christopher Carter, D, four, four. Hello team. Today, producer Neil and I have zaded out of the Watchtower to Studio City, California. Joining us is Lolita Ritmanis, Michael McQuiston, and Christopher Carter together known as Dynamic Music Partners. DMP has created hundreds of hours of music for TV, films, video games, and live performances. They have collectively earned 28 Emmy Award nominations and nine Annie Award nominations as composers for Batman Brave and the Bold, Justice League, The Zeta Project, and the new Batman Superman Adventures, and have worked on such classics as Batman the Animated Series, Superman the Animated Series, Batman Beyond, and, of course, Young Justice. Lolita, Michael, Chris, thank you so much for joining us. Great to be here. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that our discussion episodes draw on anything and everything related to Young Justice, including, as of today, up to episode 9 of season 3, the tie-in comics and the video game. If you've not seen, read, or played all the material and are spoiler wary, please consider this your warning. And with all that out of the way, let's dive in. Before we get into your history with music, and these incredible series you've worked on, I would love to know a little bit about what your experiences were with, if any, DC and comics in general before you started working in animation. Chris? Um, I actually had very little exposure to the comics themselves, but certainly watched the movies and the cartoons, right. and uh, I was very interested in the characters themselves. And so it was even in college when Batman, the animated series debuted, uh, I was so excited to see this new take on on the the character and the the stories that Bruce Timm and team were to tell. Yeah, you and I are the same age. <laughs> I was channel surfing when I came across Batman the Animated Series, and I was like, "What is happening right now? Did she just say Bruce? Did he say Selena? Is this what is this? You know, life before the internet, so we didn't know what was happening. And amazing stuff. And what about you, Michael? Um, for me, I guess it was Saturday morning. That's where I first learned about Superman and Batman and all the gang. The, the the Justice League cartoon specifically, you know, oh. in the Hall of Justice and all of that. Oh, the old Super Friends. Super cartoon. Friends. Super yeah. Friends. Yes, yes, sure. just Super Friends, and you know, Aquaman and his do 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 all that, um, which was very fun. I mean, completely different take than what we've been exposed to the past different. twenty years. Yeah, so, yeah. but that was great. Um, and then, of course, the live action Superman movie came out in nineteen seventy eight, and yeah. that's completely stole my heart and was kind of responsible for me becoming a film composer. So. Because of the music that was in the film? Because of the music, yeah. Because, um, yeah, I'm from a very small town in the Midwest, and I saw it at our drive-in theater wow. with the little speaker on <laughs> the window high, of the car, quality, right? you know, with the little mono <laughs> knob that you turn. And I was still so compelled by the film and the character and then the music behind all of that and the way the story was told. Um, I'm not, I mean, I like Superman anyway, but this was just like sensory overload you know, being yeah. at the theater even with that tiny little speaker and it just completely captivated me so the music and the effects the effects for the time were yeah i mean the whole thing was you'll believe a man can fly because we'd never seen anything like that before it was amazing and so i guess you know it's superman that made me a film composer <laughs> yes i have heard rumors you are a superman fan yeah yes. that's right yes batman or superman for you it's superman oh i'm yeah he's got a superman ring on everybody <laughs> on his finger i didn't even see it nice and what about you, Lolita? Well, I watched the live action Batman yes. after school. And 66 I just, Batman. Yeah, yeah, I just thought that was so fun. And I, I, I watched it over and over again. It's, I mean, at that, you know, at that time, you couldn't just, you know, repeat. You'd have to watch, well, stay tuned to the next day. I know, right? watch, Or Same next week, time. even, Same you know. Time. Yeah. So that was really my only real um, contact with, with su the superhero world until I started working for Shirley Walker. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my dad used to teach at uh, Dayton in Dayton, Ohio, and he said they had to cancel classes that were being held during the time in which Batman was airing because no one was showing up. 
Wow. <laughs> that was <laughs> <amazing>. bonkers. <laughs> yeah, uh, amazing. And of course, I used to watch those as well. It's like maybe so fun. A little bit of reruns, <laughs> short reruns, but they were amazing. Um, so, th- so then speaking of this, so you all have connections to the legendary Shirley Walker, kind of how you all kind of got into the industry. But can you talk a little bit about that and start back with Lolita? But like how you, why, why did you get into this? Why was this the thing that you wanted to do? Well, Shirley was a, a pioneer on, on so many fronts, but uh, she had this amazing gift to want to mentor and bring new talent into the industry. And I think that when I was, when I actually had the opportunity to work for her, I certainly did not realize the magnitude of what was about to unfold <laughs> um, as somebody, you know, hungry for work and, and wanting every opportunity under the sun. Um, when I got the call from a colleague who's actually a music contractor, um, who or the late Patty Zamiti, she said, oh, Shirley Walker's um, wanting recommendations for up and coming composers that would be interested in working for her. I said, sure, that sounds cool. What do I have to do? And I sent the demo. I didn't, I knew about her um, from when she had been writing for Cagney and Lacey and a couple of oh other, a couple of other dramas. And for me as a woman composer, just the idea to even see a woman's name on the screen was a real rarity. But, um, I was a, I was a fan of hers, but I just thought, just like all the other kind of opportunities, ah, oh, you send your demo in, whatever. We'll see what happens. And I wasn't even on pins and needles. But then when she actually called nice. and offered me this opportunity to work for her first, first orchestrating and, and kind of learning, learning the ropes in her style, basically, um, it eventually led to to composing for Batman the animated series and that's where i met michael because he was also one of these one of the shirley uh can we say guinea pigs? Were we like guinea pigs? I guess. Maybe. It was an experiment, <laughs> so yes. We, it was a little bit of an experiment because it wasn't only about music. It was also about personalities and mm-hmm. and how we would blend together and if we could actually take this opportunity and and be a, a mutually beneficial opportunity for, for all of us. Right. So, and that, that's, I think those are the people that actually were able to kind of rise to right. the top. Were you, so it sounds like you were working doing other things when this came through. So you had significant material to be able to send in. Is that is that correct? I did. Um, I was working at that time. I was a fairly busy orchestrator where I worked for other composers orchestrating their music, which for those who don't know what that is, often a composer, ourselves included, we start with a basic idea, a, a kind of a sketch if you or an outline as a, as a, a as a writer would have maybe yeah. an outline. And then the orchestrator takes it in and flushes it out for the full orchestra or, or whatever instrumentation is, is involved. So, I mean, that was my kind of my second job. My first job was proofreading, proofreading orchestrator and composer, the sketch against the score, going to the recording sessions, being a fly on the wall and getting paid. You know, I, at that time it was something like $13 something an hour, which I thought was just a lot, a lot and crazy a lot. And <laughs> so, me to do this? Yeah, yeah, and then that was at Warner Brothers. Um, I kind of settled in at Warner Brothers and did some, uh, now they call it additional music writing, but it was at, at that time, it was some ghost writing for some other composers. And but it wasn't for animation, it was for a live action? It was for all sorts of things. Um, yeah, I, I worked on some fairly big TV properties as writing quote unquote additional music. And then the, the features... I orchestrated for um, like Michael Kamen, a little bit for Basil Polidori, some things like Robin Hood and oh, and yeah. the Die Hard, uh, Die Hard, Lethal Weapons, oh, right. you know those those kind of movies. Was Batman the Animated Series the first animated related product that you'd worked? It on? was, it yeah. was, and I had no idea that it was going to be this magnificent. So. Well, yeah. it was. Yeah. Sure, sure. <laughs> well, I'm not, I'm not, it's not, I'm not patting myself on the back. I'm saying like, you know, lo- looking That's back. That's what I'm here for. Looking back, looking back, back, it's just breathtaking to, to yeah. have worked on something like that. We're definitely going to talk a little bit more about that, but I, I definitely, so Michael, you met, you, you two met through this Shirley Walker program. Is that correct? I, yeah, I never heard it referred to it like that, but it was really kind of that. Um, yeah, that's how we met. We, I think we were the first two people that she tried out, mm-hmm. you and me. And so, um, which was really terrific. It was the first gig I'd really ever had as a composer, that's for sure. I mean, I, I did what Lolita did. I worked uh, as an orchestrator with Shirley uh, on her own music. 
And then she would give me a couple of cues and Lolita a couple of cues. And then she would do a couple of cues and we would like do the uh, three-way split on a show. And that was like our first opportunity. I think it was Pretty Poison, Christmas of the Joker or something like that. I want to I wanna stop for a second. So uh, just for my background, I know nothing about anything you're talking about. So I'm okay. going to ask you some questions because Good. I know what it's like to work collaboratively on uh, game design. I know what it's mm -hmm. like to work collaborati collaboratively on a writing project. But I have no picture in my head of how this works. So you you guys worked on the same piece of music in three different ways, or you worked on an episode and each took a section? Like, how do you work together as a team that way? Well, she, it was her call, and what she decided to do was she would uh, go through the show and decide where the music was going to be and how that all... Uh, she would make a list of all the different musical pieces that would be throughout the show, and we call those cues. Okay. And then she would say, okay, you do these two cues and you do these two cues and I'll do the rest of the cues. Got it. So then she, it, within one show, she would choose which pieces would go to which composer. And that was a thoughtful choice because it usually had something to do with something thematic. Or in my case, with Christmas of the Joker, she asked me to do the source pieces that were played on the record player that the Joker was doing. Yeah. So that's what I did. But you didn't do that in Christmas of the Joker. You did something different than me. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure your things were related to one another. And then she did other things. So okay. she made those choices. Which that brings up another question I was going to ask. I'm going to get to you too, Chris, because I have things to ask you. So, um, but in, in general, it sounds like, do you guys get just storyboards to work with? Or do you have the full, like either film or animated episode and then do the music after the full animation and voiceover is all done like how do, where does it go in the process the music creation aspect for an episode um it slots in right before the final mix okay. so with all these other processes that you're talking to other people about we're we're almost last okay <laughs> we're like next to last i guess you might say because our process is happening at the same time as sound design is happening and both of those things are happening right before the final mix. Okay. So we're working with a picture that has an animation specifically. We're working with a picture that has only voice actor performances on it and no other sound. No so, special effects or anything either? No special oh, effects. No, those are being created at the same time that we're writing our music. Okay, so you're doing that parallel with them. Exactly. So they, will, they are going to have what we call a spotting session where you sit with the director and producer and you decide where... In our case, where music is going to go, in their case, where sound is going to go, okay. talk about what that's going to be. What are you hearing? What are you thinking? How do we tell the story? In their case, through sound. In our case, through music. And so they're doing what they're doing with sound as we're doing what we're doing with music at the same time. And then it all comes together shortly thereafter at the final mix. Okay. We're going to get more into that as well. That's Great. fascinating. <laughs> Chris, as I understand it, you're the youngest music composer that's worked at Warner Brothers. Is that correct? I at the time, I was told that I was the youngest. I conducted my first episode of Batman the Animated Series when I was 22, uh, and I was fresh, freshly new in town. <laughs> freshly minted music yes. composer. And um, that's all because of Shirley, which I'm sure... You know, is it the same Is it the same Shirley Walker project? That's what I'm calling it now, I guess. The, um, is it the same project? Shirley Walker, the Shirley Walker program. Program. Yes, there you go. <laughs> She's it, laughing, by the way, and she's yes, like, and she's yeah. just like, "What are you still talking about this?" <laughs> so this, is, but that brought you in as well, or did you come in separately from the? No, no, I, I actually everything that happened was due to Shirley's um, support. Uh, I had an opportunity to meet her when I was finishing up college at the University of North Texas. Right. And uh, when I graduated, she did offer an opportunity to come out and work as her assistant, and she already had been, you know, had been refining this process of working with composers in the Shirley Walker program right. <laughs> for some time now. And um, I think that, it, you know, I have such respect for Mike and Lolita because they were the first people that Shirley took a chance on and it really required a, a special sense of, of uh, you know, political sensibilities and flexibility. And Shirley demanded all these things of the people that worked for her. And um, so you guys we're able to get past that that hump of of her opening her world to bring in other people into it, and it just it really says a lot to her amazing sense as a, as a as a mentor, but also Mike and Lolita's skills and you know and working with working under under her. So by the time I came in, um, it there was kind of a well oiled machine that she had going on. Gotcha. And uh, I I was one of the last people to come into the Shirley Walker program. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're um, just owning it now. We are. <laughs> Um, also a composer named Brian Langsbard also graduated from college at the same time uh, I did. And so we, we two were the last to come through that, uh, that door and start working on the, the animated series. And so, uh, he and I 
watched what the more established uh, mentee composers underneath Shirley had been doing to fit into that 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 world, and so we we uh, had, amazingly had this opportunity to to jump in too. You uh, trial by fire jumped in right at. I mean, you went straight into Batman the Animated Series. Yes, it, that was I was you know six months before I was watching it in the dorm room. At my college. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this wasn't even before it came out. This was as it came out. Like yes. you knew. Did you know what you were getting into? Uh, absolutely. I don't think any of. It. I mean, at that point, Batman the Animated Series had become this thing, this cultural thing, and yeah. so uh, along with my my classmates, we were just so in awe of what they were doing with the character. Yeah. And so, yeah, it was. I was kind of gobsmacked at the chance to get to join that team in whatever capacity I could. Yeah. I can imagine. You need to ask how did how did Chris have this opportunity to go from dorm room uh, to? <laughs> uh, I did hear a rumor that you knew a person who knew a person. Is that what happened? I knew a person that knew somebody that had a kind of a. a <laughs> well, I played the double bass in this school orchestra, uh -huh. and the person I shared the music stand with was uh, one of Shirley's sons, Ian. Uh -huh. And Ian was the one that uh, very graciously opened that door to to meet his mom. And um, right before my senior year, uh, I came out to and he introduced me to Shirley at a recording session, nice. and uh, where both Mike and Lolita were actually orchestrating. And I sat next to um, somebody else on Shirley's music team, and it turns out that Michael, who it was had uh, gone to North University of North Texas as well, uh -huh. and we had the same piano teacher and the same composition teacher. We just weren't there at the same the same time. So uh, bizarre. And, uh, uh -huh. and, and yeah, so that, that was the chance that I had to, to play some music that I had done for student films, uh, stuff in college for her, and based on that, um, she decided that she would give me a chance. It's come up a lot recently for some reason, this idea of being lucky, right, or serendipity, right? But every time I bring up something like, I'm really lucky to be doing what we're doing right now, uh, inevitably someone comes out of the woodwork to say, uh, preparedness meeting opportunity. That's, mm. that's lucky, right? So you were prepared, you were there, and opportunity uh, op uh, offered itself to you, and you were participating. That's what we call it on the show. You participate. And when you're participating and you can do it from this passionate space, then when opportunity comes up, you have to lean into it. Yeah. And that's what it sounds like you did. Well said. Which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. So now that we've got that, I want to kind of st take a step back to this process again. So you're talking about, uh, Michael, you were talking about like you get a full episode of something, mm -hmm. right? Right. When I'm, I know how I feel my way through a writing piece. I want, I want the reader to come away at the end of a chapter or the end of an essay I'm writing feeling a particular thing, mm -hmm. right? I want to, I want you, I want to take you on this emotional roller coaster and leave you feeling this. That's my goal, right? Right. And I, as a writer, I can feel my way through that. Do you see the entire episode of what you're looking at? Like you've been given a cue for a scene, but do you watch the whole episode and, and kind of see how that piece fits within the, the larger picture? Do you, do you dive or dive deeper into just that scene? Does any of this make any sense? Are you talking about when we were meeting with the director and producer to talk about their vision? Or are you talking about when we're creating what we believe is going to be the right music for the scene? What you guys do to me is just magic. It just, I don't, I have no idea how this process works or how your, your brain, you can look at a piece of music and you can read it in the same way that I can analyze an animated series, right? I have no idea how your brains do that. So what I, what I want is, is this idea of how do, how do you, is it an analytical process? Is it an, is it an emotional process? Is it a feeling process? Are you, when you're, when you're getting through putting that music together to make me feel like something mm -hmm. when I don't even know you're doing that to me because I right. don't analyze music. I just walk away and go, that music blew me away. Or I walk away from a scene and don't realize how you guys have helped the writer, i.e. me, you know, help that writer bring people to that emotional space. Does any of that make any sense? Yeah, it, it does. I think it's different for every composer that their process of sure. writing yeah, is makes very personal. In my case, it, it's a combination of everything you talked about. It's, it's a combination of feeling my way through emotionally and being very sensitive to the verbal aspect of what the characters are saying. But then there's also what's not being said. There's this abstract quality that needs to be represented. And I think that's what music does so well is represent this abstract quality of emotion. Mm -hmm. I mean, you literal is, is what it is, you know, mm -hmm. but there's always this other component 
when you're watching something or reading something that's the unsaid yes yeah, and yeah, so yeah. yeah i uh, um for me it has to do with connecting to to the story intimately and to purpose and to character and to try to it's a process of sort of taking on you know or taking in all of those things and being able to create something that in an abstract way represents what I what I believe the intent of the director or producer is. Does yeah. that make sense? It it does make sense, yeah. And and your experiences too. So I was listening to some other interviews and reading some things for you guys doing my own research and I know that you guys had, you know, at least some influence from say John Williams and those composers who influenced John Williams, right? right? I'm pointing point to, to Chris and Michael. Uh, you had mentioned in a thing that I was listening to that your John Williams was kind of a later for you, but it was things like Planet of the Apes and you know on Golden Pond and these drama things that kind of really reached out to you when you were talking about doing film work. Is do you feel like that influences the style that you have when you're or what you're bringing to some of these scenes? Well, probably because early on in my in my awareness of what music would do to to picture, I was not watching necessarily the same films that Michael and, and yeah, Christopher yeah, were yeah. at first. So for me, you know, especially you know in, in my teen years, I was so active in the, in musicals at, in high school, and I played in the band and the orchestra and sang and did everything. And so when I, the movies I went to, I didn't really even notice the music per se until somebody actually pointed it out. And I thought that was very fascinating that I was a musician, but I didn't uh -huh. notice it. So in some way, the idea that I knew what it made me feel was yeah. really powerful. So those, those first scores that I really noticed, of course, I then went back and, and, yeah, yeah. and figured it, tried to figure it all out. But, but just the effect that it would have on me emotionally was, was really powerful. And so as an audience member, I mean, I'm, I'm an avid movie goer. I love going, I love going to the movies. I, I, I watch stuff at home too, but I love being in the theater, being in the dark room with the huge screen and, and a bucket of popcorn. I mean, I'm your traditional movie yeah. person. Yeah. So, um, I like to I like to try to bring that kind of aspect to music spotting sessions as well. When I'm sitting here, and I would say that for my my partners as well, when we're sitting here and we're watching an episode with whoever it is, whether it it's Bruce Tim or whether it's Greg Weissman or Brandon Vietti or James Tucker or Glenn Murakami, any of these brilliant people that we've worked with, they get something out of us gasping or laughing or tearing up. Absolutely. And if if that's happening without any any other sound, if that's just dialogue and pictures, then it's it's pretty powerful for them to experience what we're experiencing. So we're this great test audience. Yeah. And that's I think something wonderful that they can get out of working with us. Cause we just, you know, without I mean we'll have snacks. Sometimes yeah. I'll have popcorn even, but it's one of those things where where then we can then take it to the next level. And if something has if we're watching the picture and something already is there and then the charge to us is make it even more that way. Yeah. Make it even more Take horrific. This and turn it up. Turn or, it plus yeah. it. Yeah. Or stay out of the way. Or sometimes, you know, you don't need any music there. It's this, these words are so powerful and they're, they're acted so brilliantly. You don't need to have wall to wall music. Let's start the music after this tragic dialogue. Let's start it on the glance of whatever, of, of, of Superman turning away. Let's start it there as opposed to while he's talking or whatever. That's where yes. spotting can make magic. And that's where we always hope that the director, producer, whoever we're actually answering to first will have the bravery to allow us to use that first in instinct that we have when we spot. I, I have so many things running through my head okay. right now. <laughs> so uh, first of all, just talking about what you just said, this idea of knowing when not to do something, right? Like with Greg and Brandon, when they're doing the show, they know when not to have characters say something. They know when not to over animate a scene. They know when to put subtle things in the background. Um, there was something I was reading. I don't even remember what band it was. I really need to figure this out. But there was a drummer on this disc of live music and they, they, they said, we, we, huge thanks to this drummer, to our drummer. And people were like, there's literally no drums in this track. What are you thanking them for? And they were like, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it was a live performance. And he just sat there by the drums and he was listening and he was just like, I, I can add nothing to this to, than what it is. And that takes 
a, a certain level of professional awareness about what you're doing. And I love hearing that. Humility, really. It really does. It's like, I'm here to participate, right? Again, I'm here to add to this. And if I can't add anything to it, why get in the way, right? Why get in the way, right? And that just hearing that, I think, is feeds into a lot of that beauty of the music that you have, like in Young Justice and all of these other shows. Like, let it, let it be what it is. Um, but you were talking about the fact that the music, you weren't noticing the music, even though you were, this is your thing, right? And I've heard cinematographers say, like, if you notice my work, you know, or lighting people saying, if you notice my lighting, I'm not doing my job right, right? It has to be this natural thing. And that's what it sounds like what you're saying. Like, I don't notice it. I just know how I feel, right? John Williams is hard, right? But, you know, it really like carries you and it's significant. But there are definitely other movies where I've gone back and rewatched it and noticed how the music is playing with my emotions through a scene. Well, you notice it, but you can also notice it and not, you shouldn't be thinking about, Oh, listen, now here come the trombones right. and, and oh, now he's like added an octave you. up, you know, let's, he's put another octave above in the, you know, the fi first violins are 8 VA. You don't want to be thinking about that when you want to be, you want to be crying when ET takes off, you know, when the bike goes up, you want to be crying and I be feeling crying right the bike. now, though. Please yeah. don't bring those scenes Yeah. Up. <laughs> no, seriously. I mean, that's kind of the iconic, you know, for me, the iconic yes. John Williams moment for me. Yes. So it's just, you know, now, of course, you know, every, you want to, you want to have memorable things. Themes. I mean, I, I I know that, you know, Michael and Christopher have written such iconic themes that I, you know, when I hear, when I hear them, it's like, yeah, it's Michael's theme or that's Christopher's theme. And I just, lo I love it and I can get into it. But when, it, when, when you first feel it in a scene, it's like, it's just, it's meant to be felt. Right. It it's all not all meant to be analyzed at that moment. Right. So also, what are those themes? I want to know what themes you guys are talking about right now. Well, I just know when, when you hear the Bat Chris's Batman Beyond theme, you know, every, you just hear the intro and everyone just like starts, even just thinking about it, we start bopping our head and we start making <laughs> so that kind of grungy guitar face look <laughs> on our face, you know. And then Michael's uh, Justice League Unlimited or, or maybe, you know, his Aquaman theme in, in, in uh, Justice League or... You know, I mean, there's just, there are these things that it just like, they start playing and it's, I just, I'm, I'm done. I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it's also fun because we get to share each other's themes with each other and then we each get to do our own take on another person's theme. So that's kind of a unique part of having three of us work together right? because someone will write a theme and then another person will have a scene that needs that theme and then they'll be able to do their take on that theme. And so huh. then we get this whole other world of of being able to grow and vary these themes between us, which is very inspiring to me to be able to take, you know, Chris's Halo theme and do something special with that, or, you know, Lolita's theme and do something special with that. So it's just a, it's another way that we can kind of rev ourselves up and keep ourselves fresh. There, there was in, there was a Justice League episode called The Once and Future Thing. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And they had a wonderful homage to The Magnificent Seven. Yeah. And I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> and I had an opportunity to set Lolita's Emmy nominated Justice League theme in kind of a, you know, this Elmer Bernstein Magnificent Seven Western way. And it was so much fun. Well, let's bring it to Young Justice for a minute because there's a specific thing that I want to talk about, which is, which I think feeds into a little bit of this, this thing that we were just talking about, about let things be what they are and not put too much into it, which is this season's Young Justice theme at the beginning, where it's almost so subtle it takes a minute to realize that the beats from the season one full scene are there. It's like you have to reach for it just enough that when you get it, it gives you a chill. How did that come about? Like, how, how, how do you make the decision of like, okay, well, so we have the theme from the original, but we want that except uh, darker, evil, and matching the theme of this. I mean, you're talking to the directors and the producers, right? But how do you guys envision something that well that was their idea it was oh and you know what i have heard you guys talk about brandon has a bit of influence like he he's connected Just with you guys bit. quite a lot <laughs> it's well, I mean, well, besides, besides that though it seems like Greg both it seems like he has does he have some kind of connection to me it seems like you guys have spoken to him in the past like working with him has been helpful because he has some kind of like he there's a there's a bridge that he has to help be able to communicate something to you guys that is helpful I think from the any any show the the, the showrunners the creative you know people in charge of the creative process and direction 
a lot of times they, they have an idea of how they want the music to feel, even if they're not musicians. If they're not going to dictate to us exactly how it is, it's more like, I want to feel this when I hear the music. Yeah. And Brandon is very, uh, is, he does do a lot of research into music and he does have a, a wide vocabulary to talk about things that he wants to feel. But, but yes, in terms of that, that was something they came to us in an initial meeting and said, we want to do something different with the theme. And uh, did they have, I'm trying to remember what, what, if they even showed us to us, anything visual to us or was it all? I think he had actually put something together that was, I think, yeah. he had taken something that he'd found on the internet and kind of roughly said, well, this is the emotional contour that I'd like to represent, but it doesn't yeah. have the right beats and it doesn't hit the right things and it doesn't do subtly what it needs to do. And so he played that for us and that was a gift because, you know, the hardest part of our job is to climb into the brain of the producer <laughs> sure. or director and connect ourselves like a Borg to what they're exactly what they're thinking and feeling and somehow reproduce that in an abstract way. Yeah. <laughs> so, right. you know, this was, it's just such a gift that he had this prepared and like he sort of said, this is sort of what I'm looking for, but not quite, but here's kind of what I like and what I don't. And so then, um, you know, he was able to give that to us and, and we kind of made that happen in a more musical and, and I think a more, appropriate way yeah. that it, it that really felt right for the show. And what they and what again as a writer myself like how I would communicate something like that just feels like a child's babble to you but guys that's okay. that had no language, right? But that made sense to you what he yes. was trying to get across to you. Babble away because right. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I mean I, I know it sounds strange. No. Also a big part of our job as film composers is to create a space where you can babble and feel okay about it. Yeah. Because, you know, we've done this enough that you know, whatever you're doing or saying or burbling is going to mean something to us emotionally. Yeah. And then we can come back to you with something that relates rather than just some, you know, give it a shot. I don't know what to tell you. That's so difficult. But right. if even a little burble babble will give us a place to begin. Right. <laughs> so it's a, you know, um, the whole necessity is mother of invention that, that, that limitation that you put on yourself can help actually stimulate creativity because you have a place in a space in which to work. Like if someone says, just, I'll just take whatever novel you've got. You're just like, I, okay. Right. Or I want a story about a hippopotamus who goes to the bottom of the ocean and discovers Atlantis. You're like, Oh, okay, I got a place to start. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's weird, but okay. Yeah. So, and that's, that's kind of what, what they do to hand to you. And then this thing you said, a spotting, spotting session was a term you used earlier. And that's this kind of between. It's, we liked, we prefer to do this in person, but it's often, you know, oftentimes, sometimes, not oftentimes, sometimes now, nowadays people won't even do it in person. It'll be like via email or whatever, but we like to sit with the, the producer or director or whoever we're going to be answering to first. Yeah. And, and in the same room and watch whatever it is together and, and figure this out. That's, that's the spotting session. Right. But I remember with the theme, uh, the original theme, I mean, it's a co-written melody, but then the realization of this short little gem for season three yeah. lived in your, in Michael's, uh, sound environment in, in his studio. And I remember going for a, on a walk one day and we were like, we're going to, we have a conference call with Brandon and Greg and I'm walking and like listening to their notes. And it's like about half an hour of dialogue of whether to add like the last note or something. Remember right. yeah. it was like, it was just like whether or not like, is it good the way it is? Or should we add that extra note on at the end or not the yeah, end, extra? Not a note written, but like one musical note well, that just like one was maybe missing, you know, and it was like right. this big debate. I think, is it still missing from the first season? Like the first season has one more note, I right? don't think anything is missing. No, not missing, but it's like if you wrote it, if we wrote it out, is it one less note? We didn't, uh, the, the way the, the melody unfolds in the season three theme is actually shorter than the melody that we used in the in the other season TV show. Uh -huh. And the contour is slightly different the way that it ends up because it leaves you in a different place at the end of the theme. It doesn't leave you in a place of resolution. It leaves you in a place of questioning you and wonder, wonder. Yes. And like, oh my God, what's going to happen next kind of place. Yes. 
Um, but relax because, you know, 22 minutes later, you're going to get the whole thing at the end of the show. It might not be what you expected, but you'll get all the notes there. So. Yeah. The questions we've gotten answers to so far just do more questions. So, I don't know about the resolution there. But these discussions are really fun that we have. I mean, it's so so fun to have the discussions with Brandon and Greg because it's it's all for this goal of wanting just to, just to plus it, to make it kind of more unique. and. Yeah. So sometimes our notes that we that we type in for the the review session, which is after the spotting session. So we have after we spot something, then we will go into our, you know, we have three separate studios, we'll write the music, and then we all reconvene and then it's like kind of show and tell. Like this is what we've done now. So and then they listen and then we have notes. And sometimes the notes that we type in of what they have to say are just like, you know paragraphs in length and the, the the change that's requested maybe sometimes is only literally like two seconds worth or something right. but it's like there's all this wonderful dialogue that we have back and forth about yeah. the motivation behind what this particular note is or this sound and it's just it's really wow. fun it's really I, it. I think it's fun well you know you change one note and you can change the tone of the entire scene and that sounds silly, but I mean, that's the, it the difference between major and minor is one note. Yeah. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. And that's what you're talking about is like, yes, it's the same theme as the first season, yet somehow you have managed to create a thing that makes me question, which is still, which is very different feeling I walk away from, even though I recognize this is the Young Justice theme, yet you have all these different variations. Like you were talking about, like somebody creates a theme for Joker or for Halo or something, and then you play with it and add different layers depending on what scene it's in like yeah, and, and what's necessary for the story right right so you said you 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 go away you each do your own you have your own studios right and you do your music you guys give each other like you take these cues in this episode you take the just like you were talking about earlier right and then you come back you consult with each other while you're working on projects sometimes yes I mean, sometimes there'll be a sound environment that needs to be in more than one scene and so we'll share you know, what we're using sound wise for that. Sometimes, like I said, we'll share themes and sometimes we very carefully assign cues to make sure that, you know, like it was 25 years ago when we were working with Shirley, one person has the thread of that story going through the episode so that all of those cues will be, will have the same approach. Yes. And that will help, you know, tie that thread together much better than if three different people did that same thread. Yeah, there's always that. I mean, obviously, you got how long have you guys been collaborating together now? It's more I, than twenty years. Yeah. Okay. So that's that's. How about as as this this team, not just the Shirley Walker project? Was it fourteen years? Two thousand four. So we're we're, we're, in our, we're in our fifteenth fifteenth yeah. year working. Mm -hmm. All right. Formally, uh, yeah. Formally, obviously you work together well with each other. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's been right? working so far. So you trust each other. But there, there's this thing that I think of when I'm working with other people on different projects. There are people I work great with. Like, hey, I can give this to you and I know what I'm, what what I'm going to get back and look at is really close to what I'm thinking. And we can tweak it and work together. But my concern is always clashing. Like, okay, we all have different views of what should be happening in this episode. Right. So there's, you know, you each have di divvied up the beats or the, the cues for this episode. Is it ever clash? Like, do you guys ever like, oh, okay, it's a little too shocking going from one scene emotionally to another scene emotionally. Does that make sense? It does. Question? But I think, I think one of the things that, I mean, God bless Shirley Walker, because one of the things she did was put together a team that had similar dramatic sensibilities. Ah. So our approach to story and music even though our language might be different and our backgrounds might be different, mm -hmm. our approach to the story is very much the same. There's a through line that you share between. Yeah, the dramatically. Three. Yeah. And she wanted that for herself, for her own music, so that we would be able to follow her dr dramatic direction and not clash with her. Mm -hmm. And in the process of putting that together for herself, she created this little inadvertent triumvirate here. here. <laughs> yeah. Well, really, we're really fortunate that she was such a good musical storyteller in terms of telling the story with the music. And she, she taught us that we, 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 you know, I, I just, from my own experience, I saw the way that she would tell the story with the music and it really resonated with me. And I wanted to try to emulate that. So I was trying to bring in her, her sensibilities of using music. And I think it's just ended up that we've all 
draw on those same types of, of ways to tell the story with the music, and that's why it works. So you think the through line that you're discussing, that, that through line you're talking about right now, that also paralleled her through line? And did you think that, do you think that you had like a natural tendency toward that already and it happened to mesh with her? Or did you yeah. learn a lot of that? From... I don't think you can learn some of that. I yeah, think some I, of it's I agree innate. With you. Yeah. So, and I know that like Lolita and I often have this joke because, you know, I'll be writing something and she'll be writing something and they'll segue into each other, but we haven't talked about it, but then we put them together and the, the, like, <laughs> they're in the same key. Oh, nice. And like it all, the, the transition's seamless, but we haven't, you know, plan that ahead. And it just happens that way. I mean, once in a blue moon, something is kind sure. of out of, out of whack, Yeah, you know, and I, you know, when we, at the preview, it's like, oh, yeah, you know what, this is not fast enough or, or just, it might be something as simple as, right. not simple for us, but it might seem as simple as just, it's not fast enough or it's too, too fast or right. something, um, which involves, you know, some stuff on our end to make it work but right. um but uh it's it's rare usually usually the dialogue in between us is it, that that seems to solve that problem so. i would think during like a spotting session because you guys do these spotting sessions generally together we right. do okay mm -hmm. so i'm you guys have to talk about that while you're watching it right we have a spotting session today with brandon and greg and we have mm -hmm. a preview session and then a spotting session and uh these these two very talented individuals are are great to work with. I mean, it's, it's a demanding kind of thing because they, both of them have, are very strong at what they do. Brandon has really very interesting and, but clear ideas, but he's willing to listen to, to our opinions. And Greg is, you know, his he, story is such an important thing for him. Yeah. So usually they, often Greg will defer to Brandon for a certain tone or whatever, but he'll have maybe an idea of where he would like to start the music based on, especially if it's his own, you know, episode that he's written. You know, right. Wanted to start music on this and then on this part instead of on this part. Right. And that seemed, that usually works out. It's something you can adapt and to. If it do, and if it doesn't, then we, re once, once they listen to the review, then we'll, we'll send some revisions or rewrites and, right. and then, yeah. you know, we go from there. It's nothing, nothing's precious. It's our, no. I mean, music is, it's a, this is a collaborative field, writing music for, for film or television. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, even though it's important, I think, to have a sense of self and have an idea of what you want to be creatively and your voice and all that. Um, if that's too precious, usually it's bad news. It's not you're not going to survive in this business. So you have to be able to kind of let it go and yeah. just work with work, work with the people that you're working with and right. to, for the common good. And also, you know, finding people that you can naturally work well together is helpful. Mm -hmm. Right. That seems to gel where you get these magical moments of like, oh, that that Lego piece fit right together. <laughs> we didn't even realize that was happening. <laughs> So uh, as far as Young Justice is concerned, is there anything that particularly unique about the Young Justice music as opposed to these other animated series, classics that you worked on, different kind of through lines, tones, ideas that are kind of feeding into your idea of the show itself when you're creating music? Um, I think that the, the biggest difference from what we've done with some of our other shows is that the Young Justice has a much more ambient kind of sound. It, it, it's music that is more about a, a texture, a synthesizer color. Okay. There's you're less... reprogramming my brain as okay. you're talking, so don't um, ignore my look on my face. Although in in season three, we have brought in uh, some some more orchestral types of instruments, more traditional kinds of sounds. But something that we do like to do is have uh, have music that people can latch onto a theme or a, you know a melody, something that people say, "Oh, when I hear this, I associate it with that that certain character." And in Young Justice, it's been more about an interesting sound as opposed to a certain melody. Mm -hmm. And so when they talk about the light, for instance, there's yeah, a very distinctive yeah. kind of warbly sound like that's created on the synthesizer. Or more than a mute. Yes. Ah, yeah, yeah. That's, that was created on a synthesizer as opposed to a flute or a clarinet. And um, that uh, using these kinds of, of textures that aren't so much melodies, but still identifiable. Interesting. As opposed to kind of the... The things for like Batman the Animated Series, which were very almost like epic. It's the only thing I think of when I think of Batman the Animated Series. Well, is be like because the, the opening. and again, this is something that that Brandon and Greg from a, from the producer side that they really wanted. They wanted the the covert ops team, yeah, to have a different sound than the Justice League. And so when it's something about the Justice League, then we bring in the French horns and the violins and all this kind of gotcha big. Okay sound that you associate with the Justice yeah. League, but the covert op stuff has leans again towards this uh, this more of a synthesized and rhythmic 
We use a lot of drums and interesting uh, ethnic drums and, and sounds that you're not used to hearing with the Justice League to have that kind of, so there's a real clear line between who's, who's being featured at this point. Yeah. And there's a, there's a level in Young Justice of, excuse the word, but there's a level of like grounded in reality, right? So the way that Brandon and Greg have described it is, first, it's teens dealing with teen stuff. Then it's a secret agent show. They also happen to have superpowers, right? So you've got this thing that's grounded in, in interpersonal and character-driven drama that happens to have this layer of 007 secret agent to it, or, you know, Incredibles kind of level mix of superheroes in this thing. So as opposed to like Superman, the animated series, right? It's flying through the sky and going to Krypton and fighting Lobo in space and like that kind of different kind of a feel than you get with Young Justice. Is that, that's kind of what you're talking about? There's kind of a groundedness, I yes. guess, maybe yeah. is the word I'm Absolutely. looking for. Okay. Is there anything, is there any particular like scores, scenes, episodes of Young Justice that jump out at you as like was particularly interesting or challenging or something that you like to go back and maybe listen to yourself or use as inspiration for other things? Because you're like, yeah, the one that, you know what I'm talking about? The one where the no, no sound in. Oh, this number seven. Yes. Did that air? Oh, that episode seven. Really I'm absolutely talking about evolution. episode seven yeah. right now. <laughs> okay, because yeah. that's yeah. that was a really episode seven destroyed me. It's it in destroyed my opinion, us too, but in a, in, 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 my <laughs> in opinion, a good it's, way. It's though. the best episode. I have we have a hundred and sixty plus episodes of a podcast analyzing forty six episodes of the first two seasons. Episode seven, maybe the best thing they've ever done. Yeah, uh, it agree. was incredible. So yeah, I wanted to talk about that. So you were saying something about the silence well, in the, space? the way that they, they approached the sound effects was very very different than uh, i think any other science fiction show that we've worked on science fiction animation superheroes in that they wanted to specifically ma you know that to honor the fact that there's no sound in space so you yes. have this gigantic epic space battle going on and there's no sounds from it unless you're in an area that has an atmosphere like inside the war world right and so like cassandra will be doing her voiceover and you're cutting to the war world taking out ships, but it's just her voiceover. You exactly. don't hear anything in the background. You're just seeing the ships exploding. But then that was an opportunity for us to really fill up this sonic space, the oh. highs all the way down to the sub lows with music. Is that something that you have to work around? Like with the special effects versus the music versus the dialogue? It sounds like a juggling act. Absolutely. That's, yeah. But, there's no, but that's the point of this episode yeah, is yeah. that there's nothing there other than music in right. space. When they're in space... When there's no atmosphere, it's only music. You you both were doing the majority of the it. It was tricky the because there were places where there would be then sound for just just maybe right. just ten seconds or something, and then right. we'd go back out to space. And so, music music was helping to tell the sound effects story too, but in in a more emotionally sonic way, yes. sort of. I, for lack of a better no, term. these are these are great. And it I was it. Uh, and uh, you know I just know it was it was so fun. Uh, spotting this and then doing the preview with with Brandon and Greg. I mean, Brandon definitely had been listening to all sorts of uh, interesting music um, that's a lot for the concert stage to um, electronic stuff. And uh, so we had to dig deep to find this. Find yeah, this. you know, another interesting thing about that episode that we hardly ever encounter in animation is that they had actually built in time in the way that they presented the story and the way that they had animated the scenes there was much more time for music to evolve than we mm. ever normally get in any animated Can you show. you dig into that? What do you mean by evolve? In well, a scene? what I mean is that, you know, one of the main differences between animation and live action in terms of just like a show is that animation unfolds very quickly and things happen much more quickly in animation. In live action, you can have a scene that goes on for two or three minutes and it, you don't notice that it's two or three minutes. But if you have that same scene in animation and you tried to animate it for two and three minutes, it yeah. would just seem like it went on forever. Because in live action, you have these contemplative moments of right. pausing and music. Mm -hmm. I exactly. See I and so you. in this episode, they were able to animate these scenes in such a way that it gave a great expanse of time for music to unfold, huh. which meant that as composers we could use a sound palette that was very different than what we could normally use on an animated series. And we could use sounds that took three seconds, five seconds, 10 seconds to fully unfold and fully flower and bloom. 
And, you're and rocking, those were you're rocking not, my world right now a little bit. Yeah. Well, those sounds are not available to us in a normal animated series because we just we don't have five seconds to you know for this sound to actually right. come to its full realization. We don't have that time. Well, I can't help but think as so as a writer, I'm watching this and I am breaking this down in beats. That's what we do in the show, teaching the creative process of writing, right? And I, I get to the end of it and I'm like, Brandon, I hate you. I love you. Like as a father and as someone who's worked critical care in hospice with people at end of life. That seam of the Philly at the end just murders me, and I'm just watching this whole thing. And now I'm listening to what you're saying and not not grasping that I I when I'm thinking back on it, I get that there were no special effects. I'm like, no, okay, I I can replay that. I know there weren't explosions, and I remember Cassandra's voice because I'm focusing on the story, but I wasn't focusing on the music. And I think now I have to go back and watch. I think you guys were part of killing me in that episode. So I I'm hate sorry, you all, but... <laughs> and I love you all for it because you had something. And I was thinking, why does this feel so different? There's something epic about this in a way that I haven't seen in even long DC animated movies right. for this one episode. And I think you just answered part of this question for Good. me. This idea of I, I think I'm subconsciously used to listening to what you normally hear in a you know you know like a, a shows I love, like you know Legion of Superheroes you guys worked on, and that right. kind of stuff. Where you know you're used to these kind of beats and things like that, and I didn't even realize that that was affecting me in a different way. Yeah, completely different cadence for that episode. It's very brave that they yeah. that they knew going in that they would hold on certain shots, or especially before we would go to go to black for a break or something. Right. That's that's generally our nemesis when we have some big moment that's happened, and and it's like, oh, could we just, just have cuts. like two or three seconds? Because when we go to black. It has to be out, out. I mean, you, right. reverb has to be, you can't have music hanging on mm. afterwards. So sometimes that's, you know, that's just a technical nemesis. So for you writers out there and you directors, <laughs> you know, if you have a moment, realize that music can help, music can help you kind of shorten and, and, and luxuriate at the same time this moment. Punctuate. Punctuate with, and don't freak out that you have to cut to the next shot right away or yeah. go away from it. Just Get all your dialogue it, packed just in. Just take a yeah. moment, take a deep breath and let us, yeah. let us do that magic that we can do. Oh, I love it. Okay. So speaking of that, I'm, I'm actually have to pause for a second to process all of the stuff that I just learned just now. Mm -hmm. So speaking of uh, you speaking to the writers out there, right? So the fans of our show have all kinds of creative interests. We know that, right? So people will call us, talk to just about comics. They maybe want to do art or whatever. They may want to get into animation. They may not. They may just love the characters. But I can't speak. I can speak to those people. I can't speak to the people that are into music, right? Emily Mayo did our uh, our music for our show, which is her take on your guys' theme from season one. Oh, um, she absolutely gave me chills. We're like, hey, do this, but don't do this, right? Tell me the name again. Emily E. Mayo. Emily E. Mayo. Yes. She needs to join the Alliance for Women Film Composers. Is uh, she a member? I, I, I don't know. Okay. All Emily, right. I'm the president. Uh, why don't you? Emily, sweet. please I contact will connect me. You. Okay. I will. Sorry. And anytime you all. say woman composer, I got it. My ears perk up. So. Uh, we, okay. yeah, we know quite a few, actually. All right. Work in the game Alliance industry for Women podcast. Film Composers. Okay. I got it. Got it. Okay. Message sorry. directly to you, Emily. Sorry. Okay. So the right. music, so the Emily writers. Yeah. So, so she, we're like, do this, but don't do this. We don't know what to tell you. Like, it has to sound like the show, but we're not going to use the copyrighted music for the show. That we, we want to have something that's ours that we can use. Okay. She came back with the first bit, and I was like, oh, it's so close, but I'm not like getting that chill that I get when I listen to Young Justice. And we're like, I think it's the drums. Like you have to have a beat up or something. And she's like, oh, I got it. And then like second take, she brought it back to me. And I, again, 160 plus episodes, every single time I hear our theme, it gives me chills down That's spine. awesome. Great. Right? I, I love go, it. Emily. And it's well like done. echoey, but not, right? So this, this, there are fans who love that kind of aspect, that soundscape that you guys do. What kind of... I don't even know what 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 can you do to help them or talk to them speak speaking to them about getting into this if they want to do music but move into something that might be it might be film you know it might be TV it might be something else is there some advice or or things that you can give to them besides uh, joining the Alliance for Women Film Composers, right? I want to give, give you at least ten I wanna opportunities say, yes. to say that, and I want to say that men can join too as supporting members. We have really cool seminars and etc. Um, but no, in all seriousness, um, we have been very encouraging of emerging talent. We take time out to mentor up and coming composers and thank you. Um, and, but it's, it's kind of paying it forward 
for yeah. what Shirley did for us. I was going to um, ask about that because it seems like that had a big effect on you guys. And I think it, it yeah. feels like you guys do not take that for granted. No, we do not. Absolutely not. It's, it, you know, it's a tough field. I'm not going to say it's an easy field to get into. Sure. Um, a lot of creative But if industries. you want to do it, if you want, if that's who you feel your, ess your, your essence is, you're a composer and you feel like your voice can be best heard being a media composer, whether it's television, video games, film, you will find a way. You will do it. Um, be the best composer you can be. Study, listen to other, listen to people that have come before before you. Have technology. That's another thing. You've got to got to be up on the technology. I mean, I always rely on Chris because he finds out finds all the greatest sounds and then he educates <laughs> us. But be a great storyteller and meet filmmakers. Work on student films. Work just just constantly evolve. I mean, if you're in your 20s and you think you've arrived, well, <laughs> you'll soon find out that, you know, it's yeah. it's not going to be a long career for you. You have to be willing to to evolve and change and learn and and just just be aware of all of it. I don't know. What about you guys? Yeah, I I just think the if <laughs> I'm going to say from my own experience because I knew I wanted to be a film composer from the time I saw that movie from when I was like 17 years old. But ironically, I hadn't really done a lot of writing at that point in my life. So I was holding on to like this- Like prose writing or music writing? Like music writing, oh, okay, like com gotcha. composing. I did a lot of performing and I'd done a lot of gotcha. playing of music and I've been very musical. You know, music, I some music, Musicals had an influence on you as well, I seem to remember from- What's that? Think. Musicals, like musical theater was part of what- Yes, that well that, it was just an outlet for me to be involved in music. And, uh, and in that instance, of course, it's music and drama, which is even better, which I didn't really get was a connective thing until right. later on. And then right. I was like, oh, oh, is that what I was reacting right. to? It <laughs> It wasn't really the score as much as it was the interaction between the theater and, and the, the music yeah. at the same time. That's what I love. Um, so yeah, but I, I would just I, I can remember I can remember applying for the USC film composing program and realizing sort of at that moment that I had not ever written any film music, and I was like, well. I need to do something about this because, you know, so, so it's like, you know, everybody has sort of this wish or this idea for their life. But I mean, the most important thing, if you really want to be a film composer nowadays or a media composer is to do it, do it right, right for a film, not just right away from, from that. Don't write for the concert hall or whatever. That's fine. I did all that. But it's not the same writing for writing in a collaborative environment with yeah. someone who is not musical, generally speaking, yes. is a much different thing than writing for yourself. So, you know, get out there and and collaborate with people on YouTube, use, you know, the internet to your oh, advantage, great suggestion. Yeah. Um, you know, find a way to be able to start the collaborative process of being a composer, working with a, a dramatist and I think that's probably the best advice I could give because the more, the better experience you have at that, the more you're going to understand all the different things that are required of you as a, as a media composer. And only, only a very small part of it is writing music. The rest of it is this interpersonal thing that happens when you're collaborating. And that's what you miss as a concert composer. You don't, you don't really have that as a concert composer. That makes perfect sense to me. And it's not taught in schools. So there's so much content now that, that needs music. And not all of the people producing this content have huge budgets. Um, but I, I would like to encourage the producers and directors out there who are working on their projects to please be mindful of saving some of your budget for post. Because what happens is so much money is spent on filming or animating, or whatever. And then you get to the end of it and you have no money left. Right. And then you wonder why your, why your product sounds, sounds, Right. Mm -hmm. There's something eh, flat, eh, flat, flat. Yeah. So, you know, not to say that you have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars. I mean, if you have it, great, but, but, um, save the sum of your budget. Just be mindful of it because you will get, you will get it back in spades. You will get it back. And it's, I mean, if, if you're, if you are coming into this business with a, with a kind of, here's my first big project that I have and I've, I've written it, I've directed it. And if you don't save money for music in a good final mix, it's not, it's, it's kind of a shame. Yeah, so allow, good. allow for that because yeah. it's, it's really going to elevate your project. Yeah. Chris, what about you? Oh, I just, I kind of echoing what Michael had said. I mean, we are such a global community now. We're all connected yeah. by the internet. We are, people are collaborating who've never even met face to face. And I don't even think that there really is any 
difference between doing games, doing animation, doing live action, doing television, doing films. It's all about creating music to help tell a story or, or sell a feeling. And yeah, just to, to get out there and to do that with people and to meet the people that are creating. Mm -hmm. You used to have to be in Los Angeles, but you really don't yeah. anymore. You really, really can have can get started and develop your portfolio and your resume and your connections wherever you are and yeah. you just make those connections and that those can help. You'll all be meeting, you know, first time directors, first time filmmakers. It's the way that you can all kind of build your career together. Yeah. Uh, it's fantastic. Is there anything else that you want to add or offer out to our listeners and fans of young justice and well, all the other the, stuff you to done? the fans? <laughs> we just adore you. Um, we, I remember very well being on these panels, uh, usually Greg Wiseman's panels where we would join in, you know, it'd be something and Young Justice and right. the fans would, you know, like, what can we do to bring the show back? <laughs> and you guys did it. You know, you did it. You did yeah. it. And because of you, because of your passion for the show and because of uh, Warner Brothers kind of willingness and enthusiasm in, in, in taking the next step with this show, you, you are the reason that we are back. And it's just, it, it just, it, it brings tears to my eyes because it's just such a wonderful thing. I mean, getting that call that, yeah, there's going to be another season five years after the fact was, was pretty, pretty amazing. It's so very democratic. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, not just bringing it back. Like we, we wanted it back. You, the, the whole team and DC brought it back. Warner Brothers brought it back. Um, but we weren't responsible for it being the number one streamed series by Business Insider's top 10 for this last week. Ooh, uh, sorry. So I'm dead right That's yeah, okay. Number one streamed series above Netflix, Hulu shows, Amazon. All they're the live on, they're on the stuff. list. Uh, all live that is the, it was the only animated show on the list and it was number one. wow yeah wow so that then that has to do with episodes like seven i'm gonna hate all of you for seven <laughs> <laughs> love in my heart for the rest of my life um so we thank you for going way above and beyond adding to this show and making it i mean i think our expectations were pretty high uh <laughs> could not have believed what we're getting right now it's amazing so thank you from from us at whelmed and from the fans as well it's just an honor to be a part of it so thanks so much for spending time with us. Uh, where can people find you and your work out on Earth Prime here? Uh, we do have websites. Uh, we are at dynamicmusicpartners.com. Individually, I do have a website, christophercarter.com. That's Christopher with a K and Carter with a C. Um, we are active on Twitter. Dynamic Music Partners is uh, Dyne Muse Partners. And I'm Utadir, U-T-A-D-E-E-R. And Lolita, Lolita is... Elbert Manis for Twitter. And then we are also on uh, Facebook and Instagram. Yeah. And our, and soundtracks are available, uh, some through La La Land Records um, and also on iTunes. And Amazon as well. Yeah. And we love work. We love working with, with uh, creatives. So, you know, anyone out there interested in, in chatting with us, you know, you, you can find us, you know. Nice. We're findable. We're findable. And, uh, one more time for the women's what was it oh the alliance for women film composers the yeah. awfc awfc and there's a website for that there's a website yes and it's we we have 400 uh, women composers now um and and it's very important mission for me to increase uh, gender parity in our business brilliant composers out there that are just not getting heard so we're all in so we'll connect you with emily yay we'll fantastic yeah. to get that going on Thanks to everyone for sharing some time with us. You can find us on Twitter at The YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at TheYJFiles.tumblr.com, our website, CrashingTheMode.com, and at our email address, WhelmedPodcast at gmail.com. You can also, of course, find us on YouTube, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. If you enjoy our show, please consider sharing it with a friend. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings help others find the show. Please continue to spread the word to friends and family about this amazing show and come online and talk to us about the incredible season three. And as always, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. 
Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Stay whelmed.